Welcome everyone to uh, yet another beer and business application episode, this time from New Zealand with... Oh wait, there's beer? There's <laughs> beer. <laughs> it's awesome. I'm Neil Benson. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Gus. Cheers. Yeah, so go ahead and Cheers. grab a beer and join us for this conversation. I want to talk to Neil about implementing projects. You know, you've obviously been building this reputation and, and kind of like a... I don't know, like a subject matter expertise about Scrum and, and why that methodology, you know, uh, well, kind of a guy or walks people through the, I guess, the best way of implementing yeah. new uh, projects. Does that only apply to dynamics? Or maybe we can start with uh, what is Scrum? Okay, Let's just so, start with that. It's a great question. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for having us in this session. I really appreciate the beer. Um, <laughs> so, Scrum is a, is a framework, mm -hmm. it's a lightweight, agile software development framework. You can apply it to any software project. Or, in fact, there's lots of uses of Scrum outside of software, but I love applying it to business applications projects because it's faster, it's cheaper, there's greater chance of success, greater chance of building what the users actually want, what your customers want, and you just have a lot more fun as well as a project team. So I've had a lot more successful projects in the last 10 years using Scrum than I ever had before that, using SureStep and kind of more traditional approaches. Right, because we did have kind of that guidance, and I think, I don't know if it's still the case, but for a while you had to have somebody certified in SureStep to even have that CRM competency, That's right? right. To yeah, there was a while. That's right. Uh, the CRM competency, but um, I guess, you know, obviously we have that kind of framework that, that we work with with Implement, but did you use Scrum from the beginning, like of your career, or no, so how I, has that evolved? I uh, was, I'd written a requirement specification for customers. So I owned my own business, increased CRM, this is 2008. Uh, wrote the requirement specification, 600 pages, published it, and the customer went, what is this? It's, it's ambiguous, it's incomplete, it's too detailed, there's bits missing. I'm like, oh Lord, we, we're meant to start the implementation next week. Did it happen that like yeah. the classic, like, uh, I know it doesn't matter, but can you please include it on the document? And then once you include it, they poke holes yeah, on it. It's like, yeah. oh, I thought it so, didn't matter. So yeah. um, she poked so many holes in it. It's like, it was clear <laughs> that this was not gonna be the approach that was gonna work. I'd heard about Scrum, I'd read about Scrum, I was like, I pitched it to, to his client, Debbie, and she's like, that sounds great. I want prototypes every couple of weeks. I want to see it, I want to give you feedback. I don't want to wait 12 or 18 months before I see this thing in production. Yeah. So, so we switched. I didn't have a lot of experience, so I hired another Microsoft partner. We partnered up together, and they provided an awesome Scrum Master who took us through it, and, uh, and that was my first experience uh, 10 or 11 years ago. That's awesome. Cool. And, uh, yeah. Also on the video, you can see he's like, I guess, the token quiet guy in the bar. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Dolman, yeah. he's supposed to be helping me out with the interview, but come on, man, chime in, help Ch out. To chime in, I'm actually looking, there's Bungie across the street. But anyways, yeah, it's pretty distracting. So, but anyways, no, so actually, Neil, this is, this, is, this is pretty cool, but now I'm wondering, you talk about the iterations of Scrum and you, you, know, you do a, a sprint and you'll provide something and you talked in your session today about, um, you had a word for it, about how you're getting uh, incremental funding yep. for your projects. Now, I know in, in Canada, I've worked on a few government projects and things like that, and the government, they're always sending out like requests for proposals, and they always want to know, and they'll go to the last page, how much is this going to cost me? How, right. What is this project going to cost me? And if you start saying, well, well let's do a little phase first, and a you know, discovery or a proof of concept or whatever, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. How much is it going to cost? How do you address that in the Scrum framework? Yeah, so a great question. It's quite a difficult one to answer. Um, there are some great case studies now of government departments. For example, the Department of Human Services in Victoria in Australia, they use an approach called Platform and Agile. And what they said is, look, we've bought these software platforms, we're going to build on that. And all if, if we can fit it onto that platform, we will, and we'll take an Agile approach. Unlike most other places where they just they want to buy best of breed and try to mash them all together, these guys said, no, we want to be agile on all of our projects and we're going to take an agile approach to funding as well. Um, that's a big change for a government department to make and it's pretty revolutionary, right? So these guys are doing lots of um, case studies and, and talks throughout Australia. But if you tell them that we will do a proof of concept, it'll cost you $100,000 or $200,000 and we'll get going, but you have to give them a range in which the entire project's going to fit. Based on what we understand about your requirements, the entire project could cost two to 2.2 million, uh, based on a couple of assumptions when you lay those out. But yeah, I outlined today an approach called user story mapping, which is a way of really rapidly coming up with a way of defining the scope, the timeline, and the cost for an agile project. It doesn't take six months of discovery and detailed requirement specs and technical designs and Gantt charts. 
you can cut right yeah. to it very quickly. And, and that's what that's what customers want, they kind of deserve, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Will you say that the Scrum methodology is more, I guess, in line with fixed fee implementations or time and material, so it doesn't matter? Um, I've done a lot of time and materials work. Like we have a burn rate for every two weeks. We've got like, if there's 10 people and they cost X amount per, per week, we know exactly what the burn rate is and we keep going as long as that team's delivering more value than we cost the client. Mm -hmm. right? And that's just time and materials. The other side is, hey look, we've got a million dollars to spend. How much can we get for a million dollars? You draw a line down all the requirements to say, that one, that's the last requirement you can get for a million dollars. And if you want to change things around, but there's still a line in the sand, you say, after that, you're, you know, your budget is going to be spent, so we can do fixed price as well. So it's quite flexible that way, you can do fixed price or time and materials, but um, what we can't really do is fix price and scope um, and timeline, you know, everybody <laughs> wants to fix all yeah. three, and that's, that's pretty, I can, I can tell you afterwards, but I can't always predict ahead of time exactly how much it's going to cost and how much it's, you know, what we're going to deliver and when we're going to do it. Um, we're trying to predict that stuff, but we, yeah. can't, we can't guarantee it. So, so another th I think I was always wondering, and I kind of, I ran into this myself because I tried, to, you know, I worked with Scrum a little bit on um, one of the projects I worked on. How do you get the team ramped up? So let's say you're assembling like, uh, you know, we have the, uh, the you know, we're, we're assembling our superhero team, we're getting all the right people, yep. and it's like, okay, that's great, but before we can go off on our adventure, we need to get ramped up on Scrum. Now, what's the timeline for that? How do you get people ramped up on the sprints, the, the methodology? Um, do you, you send them all off to some course you might find on the internet? Um, or do you do your own session, or how, how, do, how do you do that? Yeah, so you really don't have to be. That's the good thing. The first thing you need is, well, there's two things you need. A Scrum master who's experienced in Scrum, his or her job is to guide the team and coach them through the Scrum principles, through the events, uh, through the philosophy of Scrum, and, and uh, make sure that they're applying the Scrum practices correctly. And they're also guiding the product owner, and that's the second critical role. The product owner is that customer representative, somebody who's senior enough to make decisions about the priorities, can detail the requirements, and can accept the work on behalf of the users once it's done. So those are the two critical roles. The product owner typically doesn't have a lot of experience with Scrum. In my case, that's quite often a client who's a senior manager, um, who maybe you know, had no experience with Dynamics, and no experience with Scrum, and we guide them through that for the first time ever. The Scrum Master needs to have a lot of experience with Scrum. The, the development team, less so. Um, we can teach them as we go. They can take my course, they can go and sit a certified Scrum Master or professional Scrum Master course in a couple of days and get trained up. But you don't need to do that in order to practice Scrum and be successful in your first project. Oh, cool. Makes sense. Okay, so let's say I just hired in customary to do the, the implementation. What's the first steps? How do we start working? So I just sign my, let's say phase one is we're gonna implement sales, let's yep. just say. Deal with sales, what, what's first? Like what, what do we do? So okay, you designate the team, but how do we go? How do we, how does the project go? So there's a, there's a little bit of work you need to do before you start the project. And okay. that's, all you need to do is to define your initial product backlog, mm. which is just an ordered list of all the requirements, of all the things your users want and need out of the software. Just write them out and rank them in terms of priority. What's the most valuable at the top down to the least valuable at the bottom? And that's what we're going to start work on. You need to do that work before the project. And then there's some other stuff you want to do. Set up your development environments. Agree what your uh, DevOps pipeline is going to look like and who's right. going to do what in the project. Get some desks, get some logins, get some instances up and running. And then um, you start day one with a, a sprint planning workshop. And that's the first event in each sprint. And you keep that going for as long as you want. What, what do sprints look like? Is that a weekly thing, a bi-weekly thing? It's that depending on the customer or the project? Right, so in, in Scrum it says between a week and four weeks or 30 days. Mm -hmm. I like two weeks. Um, the longer you make it, people think, oh, you can get more done in a three or four week sprint. The truth but is- there's also less amount of feedback you get. Right, right. right? So if, if you're running a 12 month project with one month sprints, that's only 12 opportunities for feedback. Do it every two weeks and you get twice that. You get 20, uh, 26 opportunities. 20, 24. Yeah, 24, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's a really good beer. Yeah. Old so, oh, brother, really the really yeah. Yeah. opened. Um, yeah, you get 24 opportunities for feedback, which is great. Um, one week sprints, I think, are good for proof of concept, prototype kind of projects where you need that rapid Short feedback. projects, right? If your project um, is two months long, right. you may want to yeah. do it every week or whatever. So it depends on, on the implementation. Right. Um, so, why do companies out there are still so caught up into the non-Scrum way of doing things? 
because you still talk to companies out there and the first thing they say is like, are we gonna follow waterfall or what kind of project management right. methodology we're gonna follow? Why do you think companies still do that even though we know that an agile approach is better right. and it gets better results? Well, um, I don't know if you feel this, Nick, but I think that sometimes people take comfort in a specification. Right, it's all right. documented here. Right. Remember this first yeah. project that we did? There was a venture capitalist on the board. He said, well, if we're gonna throw out that requirement specification, how will I know when you're done? Um, and he wanted that contractual comfort of everything in this specification will be completed. Um, so it's a bit of a That's a good question. Huh? Yeah. So how do you know when you're done in a scrum? Well, don't say what I said to him, which is when you run out of money. <laughs> don't. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, don't run out of money and don't tell your customer that you're finished when he's running out of money. Right. Um, but, uh, Plus he's a venture so capitalist. He probably has a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's not, uh, I have a lot of money. Um, yeah. So you have to take a bit of a leap of faith that um, there's a different way of working and uh, we're going to work through this backlog until the team is costing more than the value it's delivering. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, it, it does take a, uh, a bit of a leap. Um, a couple of other things that people find a little bit challenging the first time they do Scrum, I like to practice a principle called emergent design. So we design it as we go, not up front. Right. So we document after we've delivered something how it was built rather than sketch it out and, and specify what was it. built, yeah. right? right? Instead of um, trying and, to do it up And right. you don't find your, you could potentially paint yourself in a corner by going with that approach? Yes. Okay. And we call that technical debt. Mm. Um, so when you, know, you build the design as best you can based on the information you have at, at that point in time, six months, 12 months later, like my current project, we're looking at the customer data model going, oh, it would be better if we did this, mm. right? So now do we want to take the decision to pay off that technical debt by refactoring that data model to optimize it and simplify it based on what we know now. We didn't know that six months ago. Right. So we've got new information now. So we find that that investment in paying down the technical debt is cheaper than spending months trying to do an upfront design that's perfect. Because you never know all the information you need to know at the time. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Uh, okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to elaborate with this question mainly to give you time to drink some beer. Um, but yeah, so when you're doing a, a large implementation and you're following an agile methodology like Scrum, you know, one of the things that I found is that it's easy to run the phases, meaning like if we're going to do sales first, like I just mentioned before, or if we're going to go live with one department or one office, and if that model works, we're going to grow into the country and then into the world, like assuming they're a global organization. I see that it's easy to run an implementation for that phase or that office in a Scrum methodology. But when the project is to eventually deploy globally, right? Meaning yep. there's gonna be other phases as you grow the project. How does Scrum apply to those things that are way ahead in the future? Do you try to predict them or do you take that same approach of, well, let's just, let's just figure out this office first and then we'll talk the other stuff. Like, are we, are, are we, exercising that principle of Scrum of designing as we go for the whole project? Um, more or less, yeah, right? So um, if you believe in that principle of emergent design and that's exactly what you do, but you try to leave your designs open. So you try to remain flexible, build in a, um, a way of expanding your design or, or adding on to it that doesn't paint you into that corner. And that's, that takes some experience. So you still need experienced architects and developers and analysts on your team. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you can get there. Um, awesome. so I've run either, like at the, one of the projects I did for a university in Australia was one faculty at a time. And we didn't know what the second faculty's requirements were. We right. just looked at the first. But you have to find them. a customer who's okay with that, yeah. with with the not having the fear of the unknown. Like, right. well, we don't know what those other faculties are gonna look like, but let's just focus on this one yeah. first. Yeah. So it has to be a good relationship between the implementer and the customer yeah. as well. Yeah. Do you have any questions? No, I was just I was just wondering in terms of the, the, the team size or whatever, like I mean, I you talk about large enterprise projects and this sounds like it works really well, but what if there, is there like a minimum size that you recommend? Like I, I know I work on a lot of projects, I work solo. I know Gus, you work on a few projects solo as well. Yep. Are there, you know, are, are there principles of Scrum that we could apply to solo projects or should we have a minimum team where this works best? Yeah, so the, the Scrum framework will say, the minimum is really three. Um, and it doesn't say what the roles are in that team of three. It excludes the Scrum Master and it excludes the product owner. So three oh, developers. Man, I was counting in the, on those two. <laughs> 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 um, so three developers, right? Whether that's a Power Apps configurator or whatever. But um, and the reason they say that is that's the minimum that in the framework that they find 
um, has all the skills to take an idea into production. Okay. Mm. But in actual fact, in dynamics, certainly in, in customer engagement and power apps, you can go into production with one consultant who can configure the platform. So I've done well, scrum projects with just myself. Of course, but, but what I'm saying is, like, I don't think that principle is skewed by having only one person, as you or me or you, doing the implementation. I think that those roles can be occupied by a customer sure. resource, oh, sure. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have someone at the customer side exercising one of one or two of those roles. Um, if you're a Microsoft partner operating you know, with a client, then the product owner is almost always a client representative. Right? That's you, right. You cannot really tell your customer what yeah. his or her This is what are. you're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Scrum Master is more often on the Microsoft partner side. Of course. Because they're coaching the team. Um, and then the developers uh, are quite often a mixture. So you might have a couple of customer people join your implementation team. Maybe they're doing data migration or they're learning dynamics, they're doing sysadmin work. And yeah, you can have a mixed team really, really successfully. Cool. cool. All right, as we wrap up and uh, we need to go get another beer, what are, <laughs> sure, sure, what, sure. Are, what are, you know, the resources that are out there that people can go to if they want to learn more about Scrum? Because I think that we'll have a combination of people that are watching this video that are already professionals within Dynamics that maybe didn't even know they're following Scrum because a lot of people get hired into a partner, they learn the way right. the partner does it and they didn't know that their partner has been using Scrum yeah. all along. Maybe they don't call it Scrum, maybe it's sprints are called iterations or whatever it is, yeah. they have a different kind of language for it, but they've been doing Scrum. So maybe there are people like that that wanna learn more about Scrum or maybe there are people that have been using Waterfall or other methods before and they want to learn Scrum. Yeah. What's the best place for them to so, go get So on, on that first part about not knowing if you're doing Scrum, so Scrum is a pretty lightweight framework, and what it says at the end of the Scrum Guide is, don't take anything away from this, right? It's like, um, I, the analogy I used to give is a, a golf referee, a friend of mine was a golf referee, and he said, you know, if, if, um, if I let you have that last 12 inches, you know, the putt, and I say, oh, don't worry about it, just add on a shot and you can have it. That's not golf, right? You've broken the rules of golf. Scrum right. is a bit the same. If you don't do sprint planning or something, then you're not practicing Scrum. If you call it iterations, yeah, yeah it's really, it's called a sprint, right? <laughs> <laughs> just stop. Yeah, just stop. Yeah. Call it a sprint. <laughs> um, you can add stuff to it. So right. planning poker is a way of estimating the size of the items, right? That's a, a technical practice we can add to Scrum. And so a good Microsoft partner will have a range of engineering practices that they will add to their Scrum projects given the, the requirements and stuff right. for the client in front of them. Um, but don't take anything away. So if you want to know what the basics are, the minimum is described in the Scrum Guide. Uh, and you can find that at scrumguides.org. Download that, it's 20 pages, and that's it. Um, if you want to come and take my training course, you can learn all about that at customary.com. And I've got a, a training course um, and gives you not just the basics of, of Scrum, the roles, the events, and everything else. I want to help you get certified. And I also want you to learn something about how to apply it to a business applications project. So I've got some case studies and examples awesome. of how I've succeeded in applying it to, um, to my business applications projects. As well. Awesome. Well, thank you, Nick and Neil, for joining me. And thank you guys for tuning in. We'll Cheers, see you in the everybody. next one. Cheers, Cheers guys. Cheers.